Ruben Funkawadl Guevara is a badass. <laughs> I don't, can I say that? Ruben Funkawadl Guevara is piña, mango, papaya, swirl of culture and history from pre-Columbian to postmodern times, and he's my hero. To me, Ruben Funkawadl Guevara is a cultural icon, and also he can sing. He's the best of what this city is. He's hot LA fire. He is an American hero. A legend. He's a great misfit. He's also a cultural theorist. He's just part of that foundation that created this building that we call the Chicano Experience. The program was made possible in part by City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, National Endowment for the Arts, and the Frida Berlinski Foundation. My name is Ruben Fancahuatl Guevara, and I'm a Chicano culture sculptor. My mother's family came uh, up here from Mexico, and they settled in a little Mexican-American barrio in Santa Monica. It's called La Vente. And my dad came up here to the U.S. Uh, on a tour with uh, Trio Los Porteños. He played some pretty important gigs. He did uh, the Chi Chi Club in Palm Springs. Frank Sinatra even showed up. He used to sit in with my dad's band. Later, I caught a show at the Sahara, and I caught Louis Prima, Keely Smith, with the wild Sam Buterin, The Witnesses. Come here, love me. Come here, love me. Hey, Marie. Hey, Marie. Come here, Sam. And the energy, it was just exciting. It was nothing like Mexican traditional music. I was hooked. I still appreciated the traditional music my dad played, but I wanted a swing. I wanted a rock, man. You know, I mean, let's face it. I was Mexican and American. Mexican-Americans looked down on the recently arrived immigrants, and then the prejudice went the other way, with Mexicans calling Mexican-Americans pochos, somebody who can't speak Spanish well. Pocho was the word that uh, a lot of people from my generation grew up with. And it's very, very pejorative. It's garbage, trash. As I sit here wondering, I'm wondering what, which was worse, to be being called a pocho or a Chicano? I think they were both of the same negativity. It was hard to find validation. So what we did do we self-validated. We had to wait till we had our own teachers, our own teaching at our own universities, Chicano studies, before we could self-identify. We took a class called Chicano Thought, or Mexican-American Roots in Mexico. So we started to really learn the history, the fact that we were pochos, and we took on the whole thing of, even Chicano was pocho. And that's why we, we took it on. We took on that word because it bothered people. You can understand that relatives back in Mexico, they were looking at us as the people who abandoned them, who gave up on their culture. For Chicanos in general, said, if, if we're not completely accepted there in Mexico, and we're certainly not completely accepted here in the United States, then where do we belong? Maybe we belong everywhere. 
you sure there's no other catch to this? No, that's all. Because these youngsters from Liverpool, England. When my grandparents got a TV, I noticed that there weren't any Mexicans on TV. <laughs> Late 50s, along comes Richie Valens. Richie Valens was like a shooting star. He comes out of nowhere, he shines brilliantly for a relatively brief period of time, and then he's gone. He had this big hit, La Bamba, and it was sung in Spanish. It was unheard of. All of a sudden, you have not just kids who grew up listening to Spanish, maybe speaking Spanish, but you also have their fair-skinned counterparts who suddenly are just totally intrigued by this song in a language they can't understand, but it's certainly something that they can dance to. It's got a rhythm. Richie Valens was, was called the Little Richard of the San Fernando Valley. Little Richard was my idol, too. I mean, that's how I started singing. My beloved one, my beloved one, my beloved one. I decided I wanted to form a doo-wop group. So I put together a group in high school with my buddy, Pablo Amarias, and uh, we formed the Apollo Brothers. We were doing gigs around, you know, high school and dances, parties. And uh, later, out of high school, we got signed to a, to a label. Unbelievable. After we released our first record, we started performing in concerts, on the radio, even TV. We weren't making any money, but it was pretty exciting for a couple of 19-year-olds just out of school. After a couple of years, things weren't moving forward for us, so me and Bob were split up, but I kept on singing solo. And around this time, my mother is working as an actress in Hollywood, and. Uh, she worked with some pretty big stars like Anthony Quinn. So she had some connections and she got me an audition for Shindy, which was the hottest rock and roll show around in the mid 60s. Howdy, hi, Shindiggers, and welcome again to America's first and favorite musical show of its kind, Shindy. Let me hear the choir sing. I saw him on, was it Shindig? I was like, that's Ruben? It was wonderful to see. So here I am, on Shindig, with my rock and roll idol, Bo Diddley. Surreal, it's great. Bodelli was great. We shared our dressing room together and it was cool. In a place like LA, we are not nearly as visible as we need to be. So the work of making us visible, that's part of the movement. And Ruben Guevara has been doing that since he was a kid on the scene, playing Shindig with Bo Diddley. Ruben put our face on the music we would see on TV. And don't think it wasn't noticed. There was just one catch. They wanted me to change my name to J.P. Moby. I don't know, you know, I didn't want to change my name, but I figured, hey, Richie Valens was Ricardo Valenzuela. So I became J.P. Moby. Tonight, Cindy proudly 
I was torn about it, but I was young, and I wanted to make a name for myself. I just never imagined I'd have to do it with a made-up one. I quickly learned one thing. In Hollywood, you're a product, not a person. Soon after that, the show was canceled, and thankfully, so was that stupid name. We have been told and we have felt that the only way we were going to be accepted was to be American. So the colonization of people and feeling like if I act more American, if I dress more American, if I speak more American, I'm going to be accepted as an American. I'm going to have more opportunities because I'm American. I heard a Frank Zappa record called Cruisin' with Ruben and the Jets. At first, it kind of offended me. And then I read the liner notes, and it said, the present day Pachuco refuses to die. I thought, huh, how does this guy know about Pachucos? So I went and I checked him out. I went to the concert, and then I got it, Ruben and the Jets was rock theater. Just bear in mind some of the important things that you have to discuss with these people. One of them might be muffins. So I was impressed and I decided I wanted to go backstage and congratulate him, to meet him. So I walk in and I tell him, hey Frank, thank you for doing doo-wop during all this crazy acid rock. And I said, by the way, my name is Ruben. And I used to sing a little doo-wop back in the day. And he just looks at me and says, oh, Ruben, huh? And what I love about that was not, you know, him saying to Zappa, like, you're, you're fake or you're, or you're appropriating. It was like, hey, I see that you love this and you're making this kind of tribute um, but I'm from this culture, and I, and I know these streets, and I know this music, and I know these people. Why don't you let me become part of that performance? And, it, and so he became really part of a, a kind of, a, I, I see it as like an extended Zappa performance that then took on a life of its own where, where his musical career took on a new chapter. When I think about Ruben, Guevara's group, Ruben and the Jets, I really hear soul in there. It's rock, but it's also got like definite soul influences. It wasn't doo-wop, it was rock and roll. It was hippie doo-wop. It was kind of like um, Summer of Love doo-wop. You know, a million scarves <laughs> doo-wop, you know. Right. He represented that also that Chicano freedom. You know, that new neo-Chicano. I put a band together and started writing some songs with Frank. We had some pretty big gigs with some pretty big names like T-Rex, Three Dog Night, Doobie Brothers. We even played uh, Royal Stadium, <laughs> Kansas City, over 40,000 people. That was a trip. But there was this one club in New York, Natchez, Kansas City, and the marquee, it read, Bruce Springsteen and the East Street Band, Bob Marley and the Wailers, and Ruben and the Jets. Not bad company, man. Boom, 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 boom. boom. So Frank and I are working on the second album, and uh, we decided to call it Gonzafos. Gonzafos is uh, it's a term that is part of Pachuco Chicano graffiti culture, and it means exempt from danger. And it was the first 
album cover by a major record label to feature Chicano graffiti art. The biggest art that was happening at that time was album art. So I like the album covers. <laughs> Everything about this record, I mean, obviously the songs are fantastic. You, you can really hear the, the you know, the doo-wop influence, early R&B influence. You know, the cover art is so important. Again, like positioning him in place, right? Standing underneath the sign of Soto um, against a wall where there's tags, right? So that this record becomes an additional tag. The songs become kind of sonic tags on the wall of Los Angeles. He was making decisions about how he wanted to present himself. Even though he wanted to push ahead within the music industry, uh, that takes a kind of, you know, cultural bravery. It's a holistic way of looking at life and art, that it's all a performance. You're always on stage. That's been his project, putting us on the map and tracing the contours on that map and showing us who we are to ourselves and to the rest of the world. So during this time, there's problems with the band. They just weren't getting the idea of rock theater. So the jets are starting to implode now, and a manager tells me that, that they're banned from every Holiday Inn in the country. Things are starting to fall apart, and the jets crashed and burned. So after that, I decided I want to go back to school and, and continue with experimental theater. But this time, talk about the Mexican-American experience. I took some Chicano studies classes and uh, I wanted to see firsthand the pre-Columbian Mayan ruins. My mission was, was to reconnect with my Mexican ancestry. I sold my car and took a train to Guadalajara. I wanted to go check out the ancient ruins of Palenque in Chiapas. So I was looking for the bus station and I asked this older gentleman on the street for directions. He asked me where I'm from. I say, Los Angeles. He looks at me like I'm some kind of lowlife and says, oh, you're one of those American pochos. I tell him, no, I'm Chicano. He says, even worse, Chicanos don't have a culture. They're mongrels. I was so shocked, I didn't know what to say. There's always been mixed descriptions about the origins of the word Chicano. There's always been mixed opinions about uh, what it really means. When I was a kid, uh, the term Chicano was not very favorable. It's not that your mother would say, ah, you dirty Chicano. It's just, it was just a word that didn't come into the culture. Ruben Guevara comes into Chicano, Chicana art, history making in the middle of the movement, the Chicana, Chicano movement. And one of the main points of tension at that time was between what we call cultural nationalism and a more anti-nationalist hybrid uh, view of uh, history and culture. And Ruben Guevara captured the spirit of that across the span of his career. In 1971, I take a trip to San Francisco and I caught this theater piece. It was a mishmash of theater, music, dance, all these different elements all mixed together. 
that sparked an idea. So that idea evolved into um, my first performance theater piece. It's called Who Are the People? A gospel rock cantata. And I wrote it as an anti-Vietnam War statement. So we were fighting a war that really didn't serve us. Uh, and then we were hearing the sounds and music of, of, you know, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And that really stirs the imagination of the artist in people, you know, of saying, well, what can I say to add to that? It had a message. I call it kind of like primal theater. And it got great reviews. So I decided this was the direction I wanted to go in. Chicano culture is a very widespread culture and has a lot of different parts in it. You can't describe it in, in one breath or even one sentence or in one day or a month or a year because it keeps changing. That is the essence of Chicano culture. It takes whatever's put in front of it and incorporates it into their, their definition. I think that being a Chicano has got to be an option. It's got to be seen as a choice, not as something that you're stuck with for it all eternity. I don't feel like I'm betraying my Latino roots if I'm able to go out and have some French coffee or to eat sushi or to have chicken and dumplings. Why should I deny all of these wonderful opportunities in life because I identify myself as Chicano, Latino, whatever you want to call it. To be a Chicana, for me, that's knowing that my language is valid, that it's beautiful to speak Spanish in the United States is normal because we were part, like, especially here, this is part of Mexico. And we spoke Spanish before you all came over here. So feeling like my place in the United States is not only valid, but for you to deny it is you denying your own history. A couple of days after my encounter with that old guy in Guadalajara, I made it over to Palenque. Man, that place really blew my mind. I felt this intense connection to my ancestors, the journey of my family, all leading up to my life at that moment. I decided to climb the temple of the inscriptions. And as I'm climbing, all these questions start coming up in my head, like, what does it mean to be a Chicano artist? How can I make a difference with my work? What should I be doing with my life? Then I kind of had this epiphany. A Chicano artist would be someone who uses creativity to contribute to their culture and help shape it, kind of like a sculptor. Huh. That's when I knew. I knew what I was going to do, and I knew what I was. A Chicano culture sculptor. So I come back to LA and I create my first piece of Chicano sculpture. It's a song poem, C slash S. It's an abbreviation for Consafos. And I address the racism that was experienced by Mexican Americans and, and Japanese Americans during the 40s. LA. My city of the angels. We came to work your fields of plenty. We made you rich. You paid us pennies. We laid your railroad over his trails that once were ours. We taught you how to mine your gold, rope your cattle, and irrigate your land. Your land? Consafos, what that strange right on the walls of LA? Consafos. Won't you listen to what the walls have to say, LA? What they're saying is, Que viva Los Angeles! Que viva mi tierra! Hey, long live LA.
Whenever I like think about the greatest LA songs, or people who are like, you know, if you could put together your top 20, you know, most important songs about Los Angeles, Consafos is always on that list. Um, to me, that is um, just a quintessential Los Angeles song. And it's quintessential on the one hand because it was such an important piece of the Chicano movement. It was such an important commentary on the history of Los Angeles as a Mexican city. It's quintessential also because it's a song about marking up the city. I mean, Consafos as a tag, right? As a wall tag of saying, we are here. So I see that the song almost as a kind of musical tag, uh, as a sonic tag of saying, I'm gonna leave my mark on the city. You know, because it's basically, it's just like a history lesson. And it's just like, let me tell you the history of Chicanos. And let me tell you the history of conquest. And let me tell you the history of colonization. Let me tell you the history of indigenous life and how it relates to Mexico and how that relates to Los Angeles. And I'm gonna do that in the style of a spoken word poet, but also in the style of a doo-wop singer, but also in the style of like Little Richard. Um, and you're never gonna get bored. And it's gonna be dogmatic, but it's also gonna be poetic. Consafos is, is a C slash S, Consafos with Safos, whatever their interpretation of Safos means. It means no bombsies in the days. You can't, you can't cross this out, because if you do, everybody that's in the Consafos side is going to talk to you about it, you know? <laughs> that was something that belonged to us. That was something that you put on your graffiti. Consafos means anything you do to this wall, we're going to do to you. So do not touch this wall. This is ours. You do not belong here. This is our territory. Viva Los Angeles! Viva mi tierra! Hey, long live LA. They were bomb, 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 so I come back from Mexico and I'm working in this record distributor downtown. And Richard Foos comes in, he had a record store he was starting up called Rhino Records. And he was also starting up a, a label. He knew about my background that I was with the Jets. So he asked me if I would record a doo-wop version of the Star Spangled Banner and America the Beautiful for the U.S. Bicentennial. Ruben and I first met in 1976. I just started my record label, I had a record store. For our second record, I wanted to do a doo-wop version of the Star Spangled Banner. It was the bicentennial and kind of wanted to poke good-natured fun at the seriousness of our uh, national anthem. And I thought, yeah, that'd be great to turn those anthems <laughs> into a parody, you know, kind of Chicanoize them. I said, yeah, let's do it. Does that star And it was the last doo-wop record by Latinos ever recorded in L.A. Be good about that. And the home of the... They were bomb, 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 We're gonna have a bad band. Uh, we had them eating right out of their hands. Huh? Wow, we're gonna be big, man, really big, man. We're gonna like be bigger than Ruben and the Jets, man, I bet you. So around this time, Cheech and Chong are the hottest comic duo around. And somehow, the Star Spangled Banner record got into the hands of Lou Adler the manager, and I'm set up for an audition for his new movie, Up in Smoke.
Ruben was, since I met him, we were kind of buddies, you know, we hung around, we had the same kind of background and music and, and L.A. And we understand the whole Chicano scene, so we started hanging. I would laugh when I would see him in some of the early Cheech and Chong films. How do you recognize him? Here's Alice Bowie. But for the audition, I'm in the back seat of a car with Tommy and Cheech and uh, had to improvise with them. The hardest part was not cracking up, man, I'm telling you. But I got the gig as a backup musician in their band. It was a ball. And to see a Chicano and a Chinese collaborating and making it work, you know, talking about Chicano issues, you know, I mean, all the comedy of, around that. Nobody was doing that. Mexican Americans love their nanas and their nonos and their ninas and their ninos. Nanu, nanu, nina, no, no. We just saw the humor in it. You have to see, realize, Mexicans have a lot of humor. In their pain and everything else, they'll flip into a, something funny. Man, working on that film, <laughs> it was tough not cracking up during takes. You just had to really be quiet, but man, they were funny. Funny. Crazy locals, man. Crazy locals. I got a chance to, uh, to work on the film Nice Dreams. I wrote the title song for it. Hey, baby, won't you come along and take a trip with Cheech and Chong? That was a gas, man. That was a trip. And finally, these guys are giving me a chance to write music for film. It's fantastic. But then, <laughs> Cheech and Chong break up. That's Hollywood. Oh, well, back to making art. The second act of subjugation, of an illusion. A hundred years later, Zapata and Villa fought for land for us, and for a short while we had it. Again, an illusion. I escaped my own sacrifice. We didn't all sanction it. And besides, it's a great exaggeration. No matter what kind of wild art projects I'd get involved with, I'd always come back to music. I wanted to start a label featuring Chicano rock, past, present, and future. So I put together a bill called the East Side Review that included uh, up and coming Los Lobos, 60s legends, Cannibal the Headhunters, and a couple of members of Ruben and the Jets. And it was backed up by my band, Gonzafos. It was an incredible evening. You know, I went out there, you know, I, I, I knew the musicians that he had put together. And of course, Ruben, in his own unique way, was able to. to put all those musicians together and, and play this music that was just kind of uniquely his own. He sold out two shows, and there was a buzz going around. So I decided to talk to Richard about starting up a label. I think at that point, there really weren't any Latino music-focused uh, record labels, so we were hoping to be one and really do both, both look backwards in the past and do compilations, and then you know, new artists, and even uh, sign some new artists. So we formed a label called Zanya, and uh, we put together three compilations. Los Angelinos, the East Side Renaissance, Best of the Midnighters, and a compilation that included a, an array of artists from the 60s and 50s. 
was called History of Latino Rock. For me as a researcher and writer and fan, those compilations were windows into histories that I personally had no knowledge of. So I, I see his compilation work really as a, in a kind of curatorial spirit, but really in an archival spirit, that, that he was documenting layers of Los Angeles music history that before then, um, I wouldn't say had been erased, but they had been ignored um, or certainly marginalized. For me, the story of Ruben is important because we can learn from that experience and we can take that experience and utilize it to continue to grow, continue to heal. Hey, are you one of those dudes that do horoscopes, man? Hey, I'm a cancer with a bad moon rising. Look here, Elfago, watch my lips. Where were you born? I was born in East LA, man. I was born in East LA. So around the mid to late 80s, Cheech makes his own movie, Born in East L.A. What's happening? Yeah, what's happening? What's that? That's it, you got it. What's happening? What's happening? I brought on as a, as a cultural consultant, and my screen credit is East L.A., cultural attaché. I helped him find locations in East L.A. and produced some music for the soundtrack. And I had a small part in the movie. Hey, Miguel, the Puerta, huh? Yeah, this time I want you to try some English out there. Hey, try some Spanish. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah, yeah, that's who you are. You're, you're still a cultural attaché, you know, and he knew exactly what that meant, and, we, and everybody that heard it knew exactly what that meant. Oh, yeah, they have, I want to be a cultural attaché. You know, what, what school do you go to for that, you know? <laughs> the school of hard knocks, Holmes. <laughs> you know, and, and, but it really describes him because he, he informs that position with a lot of experience in a lot of different areas, both both uh, uh, street-wise and uh, institutional-wise. But he is a East L.A. cultural attaché. And East L.A. Has a, has a larger sense, a larger understanding now than when he said it in those days. When I first saw the, the film, and there's that, that scene where the Mexican immigrants are rushing the border, <laughs> remind me of Cecil B. DeMille or something, you know? It really hit home. I thought of my own family coming up here, crossing that border, making it to the U.S. Yeah, I broke down when I saw that scene. Cheech asked me to, to join him on a promotional tour for the movie in Mexico. And uh, man, I wasn't sure how a movie made by a pocho would go over there. The night before the press conference and screening, I wanted to make a statement. So I stay up all night writing it. And that guy in the street corner in Guadalajara, in a funny way, he helped me write it. So me and Cheech are sitting at this press conference table and I have no idea if people are willing to hear what I have to say, but I start to read my statement. Mexicanos queridos, I want to talk about the renaissance of Chicano culture. Chicano, not Hispanic not Latino, not Pocho, as we are known to some of you. We are mestizos, a powerful mix of different bloodlines, from Spanish to Arabic to African to Asian to indigenous. Now, with all due respect, there's been a long misunderstanding and lack of respect for Chicanos, your children to the north. We've been called mongrels without a culture, traitors because we left Mexico but it was a revolution that forced my grandparents to the U.S., and we have never cut our roots with you. And as for not having a culture, well, I have news for you. We've been busy. We now have internationally recognized artists 
including painters like Margaret Garcia, Barbara Carrasco, Wayne Healy, and Judith Hernandez. Writers and poets like Sheri Moraga, Rodolfo Anaya, Gloria Ansaldoa. We have musicians, among them Lalo Guerrero, Carlos Santana, and Los Lobos. Theater and film artists like Luis Valdez, Evelina Fernandez, Edward James Olmos, and now Cheech Marin with his new movie, Born in East L.A. The fact is, Chicanos have created a magnificent and vital culture. Una cultura chingona. ¿Y qué? Gracias. Con safos. When I finished, the whole room erupted in applause. People even stood up. I guess they heard me. Ruben Funkawadal Guevara, he follows in the footsteps of other great Mexican artists. What he has done for this country, with this culture, by opening it up, making people aware of the music that has come out of this culture, he absolutely opened doors, opened pathways, opened opportunities. Ruben will be noted as or remembered as a pioneer because it kept pushing the line, you know, from how does a R&B singer get to be a cultural avatar, you know? And that's what he has done, you know, through a process of redefining how to say that message and what that message is and how that message keeps transforming. I've always had a lot to say and I've tried to say it through different art forms, whether it's music, poetry, theater, or video art. What greater atrocity? The Aztec priest offering a heart for life? Or the conquistador multinational corporation ripping out the soul but leaving the heart so the Indian beast can work? Disorient the psyche. Impose the weapon of empire, language. Your name is Indian beast. You belong to me. Drink, not too much. Eat, not too much. Run it as much as you want. Sleep, but not too much. Remember, work equals manhood. Like I said, I always come back to my roots as an artist, and that's in music. Ruben is um, a very vital link in the evolution of, of Chicano music. You go way back to um, Don Tosti, you think of um, Lalo Guerrero. Ruben kind of advanced that conversation. He brought in funk and, and rock and roll, and his own unique hybrid of that mixture of the Chicano experience and rhythm and blues. So with uh, Rhino and my label, Zanya, we put out uh, an album CD compilation called Reconquista, the Latin rock invasion. And it featured bands from Mexico, South America, Spain, and País Vasco. I think the kids in Mexico were, were embracing Chicano culture. I know Rocco, the lead singer, was. Conquista. Uh, that was one of the, the first, if not the first, compilations in the United States of Spanish language rock music. This is a you know a, a pretty vast musical landscape, and Reconquista is a you know it's a single disc compilation that kind of cherry picked key artists and key songs. But the way that Ruben cherry picked was to figure out like what's this thread of kind of revolution, liberation, protest, struggle. Uh, and a reconquest of the Americas. Without calling itself 
that, it was a decolonizing record. Then the 90s arrive, and there's that indigenous uprising in Chiapas, and something happens on both sides of the border. The Chicanas and Chicanos are looking south again. They're looking for indigenous, you know, authenticity. And people in Mexico City in particular are looking north for Chicano authenticity. It's a really fascinating moment where we're both looking in opposite directions and meeting on the border between us. And Ruben, as is his want, he knew something was happening and he put his finger on it and came up with a project that could represent it. And so he brought all these musicians together and those sessions were a blast. I love the idea of Mexamerica because it really recognized the fact that we were different than Mexicanos on that side of the border, right? That we were Chicanos and that we had our own sonic expression. So this was kind of a musical extension of what some of the transnational work that we had already been engaging in. So the whole purpose behind Mex America was uh, to first of all, tear down the Great Bocho Wall which separates Chicanos and Mexicanos. Since I struggled with that over the years. And uh, so it was a very positive album. And we talked about unifying Chicanos and Mexicanos. So that physical border wall became also metaphorical for him. It became sonic, it became cultural. And so I do think there is this thread in his work of trying to like, well, how do I use music to, you know, to, to kind of blow a hole in that wall? And even if it's not literally taking the wall down, how can we use music to move through it, to move beyond it and ask those questions? And if we can knock down these barriers for him personally, maybe that's a way into him understanding his own life and his own sense of identity in a new and different way. I think the album hit right at the moment when uh, we needed to make that reconnection across time and history that had had this, you know, tendency to separate Los Angeles from everything south of the border, including Tijuana. It was resetting something. It was recovering something because, once again, it had to do with rescuing a history that had been stripped away from us by prejudice and ignorance. As one gets older, one always looks at other models, right, of how people age. And what I love, I'm so inspired by him, is that he's someone who, as he gets older, he's constantly working and constantly changing and constantly reflecting on his own experience and his relationships. Um, and trying to, like, still make music. I just think Ruben Guevara is everywhere where you don't expect him to be. You go to a concert and you do expect him to be there, and he usually is there. Then you go to an art gallery and he's there. Then you go to a protest and he's there. And you go to a restaurant and he's there. I mean, he's just omnipresent. I knew the time had come to do my own album with my own music. I'd been J.P. Moby, I was Reuben, the Reuben and the Jets. And now I wanted an identity that was really mine. So I came up with a new alter ego, Funko Watl, the neo-Chicano Aztec God of Funk. It kind of embodies the musical and spiritual roots of my career, as well as my life. And to this day, that's my name. So this time, the the Chicano culture being sculpted was me. The album was titled The Tao of Funkawatl. And uh, I decided to dedicate it to my father, who taught me to sing back in the day, Mexican boleros. Cactus flower blooming in the moonlight. Ruben worked very hard for a lot of years to formulate this view. And that's the only thing that an artist really has, how he sees the world. I mean, that really is, I mean, you have a facility in some painting or singing or drawing or writing or the, but the only thing that distinguishes an artist is what he sees. You know, Ruben was thinking about this stuff not as an academic, not as a scholar. He was thinking about it, at, you know, as a cultural worker, as a musician. He was approaching it 
you know, largely from his own personal perspective, but then always had that vision and that wisdom to say like, well, maybe my personal biography is an avenue into thinking about larger cultural struggles um, and larger political topics. And he's done that his whole career. The future is now, so get on track. Oh, she's a plus spirit, I'm a rolling stone. She's born a sweet child of God, I'm born a flesh and... It is my deep honor and pleasure on this night when this book enters the world uh, to turn the stage over to, to my hero, to someone I love deeply, Ruben Cabrera. I'm past 70 now. I might only have a couple hundred bucks in the bank, and I might not know when the next gig would come along to pay the rent. But my life was never about playing it safe in the cool shade. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about becoming rich and famous. It's been about making music and making love, rocking and rolling with the punches, and letting life Keep the beat. My autobiography was finally published in 2018, and I go on a tour. Turns out that uh, the book is required reading in many Chicano studies classes across the country. And in one of the lectures, an Asian American student came up to me and said, I am Chicano. <laughs> I say, what? He says, studying the politics of Chicanismo inspired me to become one. <laughs> well, that kind of makes it all worth it, you know? Chicano identity is always evolving, but as long as we're honoring our roots and contributing to our culture, the Chicano spirit will always endure through the work of artists, and activists. And when I first heard Chicano, yeah, that's what I am. I'm not Mexican. I never been to Mexico. Don't speak Spanish. Mexican American. I hated hyphenated terms. I just wouldn't do it. And when I first heard Chicano, that's what I am. That describes me. To be a Chicano, you had to be more than just Mexican American. You got to be multi-talented. I think you have to qualify to be a Chicano because you have to fight for it and Ruben is still fighting for his place and his music. It's kind of hard to not recognize what Ruben has done even in, in present. All the work that he continues to do and be a part of is, is significant. And I always love listening to him because I feel like his passion is contagious where you can't help but believe in the power of Chicano music. It doesn't fit into the category of normal artists or normal people, he is a misfit <laughs> in many ways. And we need misfits right now because why should we fit into the system? I think he's become kind of like the Chicano godfather. I mean, I feel like he constantly is making connections, intergenerational, as well as with other communities of color. I see young people from my community, whether they call themselves Chicanos or not, I see them moving, I see them organizing, I see them building and the ethic that they're standing on is part of what Ruben built, and now it's their turn. I wish I could find that dude in Guadalajara and show him all this. Is that culture enough for you, ese? Y que? Con zafos. Los Ángeles, viva mi tierra. Hey, long live LA. This program was made possible in part by City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, National Endowment for the Arts, and the Frida Berlinski Foundation. <laughs>